Tamita mentioned in her prayer, it's the start of a new year. Uh, what well, maybe a start of a new year for you, but for me, it's September. So, uh, welcome to September 2021. Uh, it, well, it is, uh, because in September of 2021, um, we were supposed to have started as a church our new members class. And uh, obviously the Holy Spirit had done uh, some interesting things in, in August, September, and even October to where we got delayed and we were not able to start this until today. So hopefully when you came in, you were able to grab either the large one or the little one. So does everybody have their little booklets? Okay. You will need this for the next six weeks. You might even want to put your name at the top somewhere or somewhere in there so that this is yours, okay? Make sure you bring it all six weeks. I won't give you another one. This is just, you know, it's me being cruel. So <laughs> make sure you bring your book each week. For the next six weeks, we're going to be looking at this material. And um, we've been, this has been a long time coming. We have been uh, working on this new members class. I won't even say how long. It's been, it's, been, it's been a very, 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 very long time that we've been working on this new members class. But it is one of the things that now, you, you that are members of, of First Baptist Bowling Green, this is kind of your overview of it, but you already are members. But from here forward, after we finish this, any individual that wants to become a member of our church will be holding these, little, these meetings to where they can actually learn who we are, what we're about, how we do things, so forth and so on, trying to understand who we are. And so that is what we're, and we're calling it Plugged In plugged in at First Baptist Church of Bowling Green. And so we're going to start that even today. Um, and in a little bit, I'm going to get to a certain point, just, just for your information, the first three, maybe four points that we're going to look at this morning, I'm going to spend a lot more time on those three or four points. And then after that, I'm not going to spend nearly as much time. And I'm going to kind of just kind of move through those. Okay. So when all of a sudden you start looking at your watch and you go, he's not going to make it. I'll make I'm, I'll make it. We may be late, but I'll make it. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're going to spend a little bit of time on the first three. All right. Obviously, J Jerry's already leaving. Jerry said, "I uh, he's he's going to go way long already. I can tell. He just he's going like this. He's just leaving. He's waving him. Bye, Jerry. It's been a pleasure." <laughs> he, he forgot his own book. He's out there passing out the books. And didn't grab his own. That's that's kind of funny. <laughs> so, see, there he got his book. <laughs> All right. So, uh, we've already prayed, but we're going to pray here even in a little bit when we get to the point on praying. Some of this material you've actually seen before as a church, at least if you've been here any length of time. Many, many years ago uh, now, we actually had a vision workshop. And in that vision workshop, we as a church, we had a strategic planning committee that presented some of this first material here. Now, some of the other material as we go through is going to be newer material, stuff that we ne haven't necessarily put together uh, for the church uh, body like this. But this first session of who we are, who is First Baptist Church of Bowling Green? This section is straight from our strategic plan and the vision that First Baptist Church of Bowling Green voted to adopt many, many years ago. And so for many of you, though, it's been so long that you haven't, I mean, you haven't looked at it, you haven't reviewed it, you haven't refreshed it. It's not something that's kind of like fresh on your mind as to who we are and so forth. And so this is a chance for you to see who we are and what the strategic planning team came to conclusions of. And when you're starting to present and say, hey, look, this is what we're going to be doing. This is who we are. you got to find out what your core values are. What is it that actually at the end of the day, we say these are the principles upon which we stand as a body of believers. All right. And so that's what these first nine things are, are the core values that First Baptist Church of Bowling Green says, this is it. This is where we are in terms of what we believe, how we stand, how we function. In other words, if anything violates this, we say, no, we don't want to, we don't want any part of that. So if the world starts to walk a different direction and it goes in violation to these nine core values, we say it doesn't make a difference what the world does. We're going to stand on these nine values, and these nine values all come from Scripture. Now, as you're looking at your, your booklet there, you'll notice behind each one of these values, there's actually four passages of Scriptures. I'm not, for the sake of time, going to read all four passages of scriptures to you, but I would encourage you on your own, when you go home, go grab those. Now, there's really more than four passages of scripture that we could have done for each one of these, but we felt like four of these scriptures for each one would give you a, a nice overview as to why we believe some of the things that we believe. 
Now, for our purposes today, I'm going to give you just one from each of them, all right? So the very first core value that we hold to here at First Baptist Church of Bowling Green is that of family, that of family. And you can see there in your book, we describe, we tell you what is it that we mean when we say family. When we say family here at First Baptist Church of Bowling Green, this is what we mean. Because we value families, and we believe marriage between a man and a woman built through Christ-centered love, accountability, and growth through discipleship in God's Word results in strong families. Now, there's a lot right there just in that opening statement. Love, we live in a world that is, and, and, and quite frankly, this is from the very beginning, from Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, when he did this, when God created the heavens and the earth, he created man and woman, male and female, Adam and Eve. And we live in a world where a lot of people say, oh, that's just, that's fiction. That's a story. It's not reality. That's what the world says. But I'm telling you, the word of God is the truth. And we either live by the truth of the word or we don't live by the truth of the word. And if we don't believe the word of God, the scriptures tell us, Paul tells us, that we are supposed to be the most pitied of them all. That's what the scripture tells us. So in other words, we live our entire life on the principles of this. And, what, and, it's, and it goes back to even what Tabitha was just now singing just a moment ago. She was singing about the fact that if, if we really love you, if we really love God, if we really say, Lord God, I love you with all that I am, then it ought to be a representation of our very lives. When we go out into the world, our lives ought to represent what this book says. The problem is I think the church is failing on this front. And I think we're failing on this front, especially in regards in terms of marriage. We live in a world where it's, marriage is just this, this secondary nature. It's just it's all, it's convenient, but as soon as it gets hard, it's okay. I can, I can walk away. Guess what? You know, when you get married, you know what you bring into it? Two imperfect people. Do you know what that means when you have two imperfect people? It means it's going to be hard. It is not going to go the way you thought it was going to go. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be difficulties. There's going to be hard days. But we as believers of Jesus Christ, we strive, and by the way, this is, let me make another pause. One of the things we've also learned, and I've been quoting it almost every single Sunday since August, Romans 8, 1 says, therefore there is no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. Why I'm bringing that up at this point is because some of y'all, you may have already messed it up. Guess what? There is no condemnation for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. You understand? Divorce is not the unpardonable sin to the shock of many. God is a God of redemption. He can redeem something, but it doesn't change his plans, his heart's desire. Even after we mess it up and he redeemed something, the father's heart's desire was still for not divorce to happen. But if you find yourself as being one who has been divorced and now you are remarried, guess what? Do it right this time. Do it right this time. Stay true. Run the course. Fight the faith. Okay? So this is what we're talking about. So we live in a world where we say, oh, hey, whatever you want, however you want it, women with women, men with men, doesn't make a difference. No, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that marriage is between a man and a woman, and it is for life. And why? Because it is the place where the strongest families go. Look, I'm a part of a board for the care portal. And it's a, it's a ministry that deals with adoptive and foster care and the ministry of them. I'm, not, I'm on their board. You know, one of the interesting things is that the, the, the state of Florida it was actually a federal uh, thing that they did. The federal government did it, but the state of Florida adopted it. You know what they found out was the best parents for foster kids? You know who the best parents for foster kids are? Christ followers. They actually came to the church. The, federal, the, the state of Florida, the state of Florida came to the church and said, we want your help to raise foster parents, to be foster parents. Because we find more strength and stability in the family of a Christ follower than we do in the lost world. That's the state of Florida. Okay? 
That says a lot. And why? Because we hold the principles and standards that the Word of God says. Okay? So let's keep going here. So we believe that, the, that, that this is what marriage is, and it's in these marriages that strong families are built. And so we believe parents are the primary teachers of our children in spiritual matters with the hope that one day they will be a part of the larger family, the body of Christ. Now, we're doing this from a church perspective, and that's why we've put in here, we say it's the, teacher, the parents' responsibility of the primary teachers of their children in spiritual matters. Let me just add, it is the primary responsibility of parents to be the teachers in every matter. Okay? Just a little caveat, a little side note. It is not Jason's job as the youth minister of our church, as our youth pastor, to be the spiritual discipler of your kids. Okay? It's not. It is not Olga's job in Sunday school to the children or any of the Sunday school or, or the uh, extended church session folks that are teaching back there even right now. It is not their job to be the primary teacher of your children regarding spiritual matters. It is your responsibility as parents and grandparents and great grandparents. <clears throat> it comes to the family. <laughs> Diana just, I mean, uh, Janice just said it's time to step up. It is. It is your responsibility, all right? And when we do this, when we raise them up, they become part of the body of Christ as they cry out and say, Lord Jesus, save me a sinner. So then we move to the next sentence. So we understand in the world we currently live in, not every family has a spiritual foundation in Jesus. So as a result, we strive to encourage all families of Jesus' family to teach others about our Savior. Because, see, not every kid has the same situation. And because not every kid has the same situation, it's our responsibility as the believers of Christ to go and share that hope to other families. Now, where do we? I, I, there's a lot of scriptures here, but I'm going to read you Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four and nine. Chapter six, verse four through nine, it says, "Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God; the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These words which I command you today shall be on your heart." Now, here's where it comes in. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. In other words, every part of your day, you're supposed to be looking for opportunities of spiritual conversations to point your children to the Father. That is your responsibility as families. So you shall bind them as a sign on your, on your hand and you shall uh, be on our frontals on your forehead and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. In other words, the word of God is supposed to always be before us. And we are supposed to look for opportunities to teach them to our family. The second core value that we hold to is that of preaching. That of preaching. And we see, we value biblical proclamation of the scripture, of scriptures and believe God has called every Christ follower to be an ambassador. You know what that's basically saying? It is not just my job to preach. Well, thank you, ma'am. It is also your job to preach. And it's not just sitting and preaching behind a pulpit or a, or a stand or a platform. It is your job to preach in this world. So to be an ambassador of the gospel to non-believers for his glory. That's why we do this. So we believe all who proclaim God's word before the body of Christ are held accountable to God and the body of Christ. It's just a reality. You have been charged to be ambassadors of the gospel of reconciliation or ministers of the gospel of reconciliation. And you are held responsible with what you do with it. And you really do need to do and live the life that that Tabitha just sang about with, here am I, send me. See, in the book of Ezekiel, God shows Ezekiel, he shows him as a watchman on the wall. And he says, when the enemy is coming, if the watchman on the wall does not say anything, and the enemy comes and devours the people of the city, then the blood of those people fall on the watchman's hand. But if the watchman on the wall cries out and says, prepare yourself, the enemy comes. And then they don't do anything. Then the blood falls on their own hands because the word was proclaimed. My fear is, however, that we as the body of Christ are not very good watchmen and watchwomen. It is our job. If we really believe what this book says, then there really is an eternal hell separated from the love, from the love of God. It is called the lake of fire. And those who do not know Christ Jesus, no matter where they are in this world, if they do not know Christ Jesus, they will spend eternity separated from his love. 
And if we really believe the word of God and we really believe this to be true, then it is our imperative to be out there showing the love of Christ and telling them about the love of Christ and telling them there's only one way of salvation and it is found in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other name by which one can be saved other than the name of Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life and no one comes to the Father except by me. Either he is the truth or he is a liar or a lunatic. And he's not a liar, nor is he a lunatic. So if he is telling the truth and he is indeed Lord, then it is our job as his children to be watchmen on the wall proclaiming the truth. So all preaching is founded on the Bible. And as a result, we strive to encourage all believers to grow in their relationship with the Lord through his holy word in order to recognize false doctrine. <clears throat> because in this world, there is false doctrine. There's all kinds of cults out there. There's all kinds of crazy thoughts in this world. And it is our job to study the word and know the truth. And we see this in Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, verse 14, we read these words. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And again, it is not talking about me as one standing up here. It is my job to equip the body of Christ and for the body of Christ then to go and do the work of ministry. So you all are the preachers and the evangelists in this world. So am I, but so are you. So are you. That leads us to the third one, which is that of worship. We value real worship of the one and only God who is worthy of that praise. Love, when I even say that, it makes me even think of that last part. There are, almost, there are almost 8 billion people in this world, and there is only one who is worthy of their praise, and that is the Lord God. And yet they worship Allah. They worship the multiplicity of thousands of gods of Hinduism. They follow the teachings of Buddha and Confucius. They follow false teachings from like Jehovah's Witness and Mormons. They follow all kinds of things in this world. And they give their devotion to all kinds of things in this world. And those are just the religious ones. Because there's others who put their entire devotion on, on Saturday morning football, during football season, especially in the SEC. I know, just made some of you mad. Praise the Lord Jesus. You understand? We worship all kinds of things. There's only one who is worthy of worship, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we value worship of the one and only God who is worthy of that praise. And we believe this worship flows out of a personal relationship with the Lord God and is a manifest in the spiritual gifts he has given to us. Beloved, it is our job to worship. God is the one who dispenses the Holy Spirit as the spiritual gift. He ministers into our lives, and therefore, because he is the gift, sometimes he calls us to do things that are outside of our comfort zone. And he says, worship me anyway. It's not just what we do in here on a Sunday morning. That's not just worship. This is supposed to be the overflow section of what your life is representing Monday through Saturday. And we are supposed to, the only way to do that is to have a relationship with Jesus. Some of you, this is literally the only time you ever hear the scriptures. This is the only time you ever open up the word of God. This is the only time there's any prayer in your life. This is the only time there's any worship in your life is on Sunday morning. And I'm telling you, that is not the way it is for those of us in Christ. If we are truly born again, if we really have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, then our heart's desire is to know him. To know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering to experience every aspect of who he is in our lives. So our corporate worship is an overflow of our private worship and can be expressed in many different facets, but not limited to praise, thanksgiving, intercession, fellowship, and proclamation. And as a result, we promote worship that unifies the body of Christ and which encompasses all aspects of our lives. And then when we go to John chapter 4, in verse 24, we read this word. He says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. We are spiritual beings, and as a result, we are supposed to worship in spirit. 
and in truth. All right, now these last ones we're going to run through much more quickly. Fellowship. We value fellowship of like-minded Christ followers that nurtures a spirit of unity. Kind of heard that word a few times, haven't you? Because we as the body of Christ are supposed to be one, unified. We believe fellowship is a gathering of people bonding together through church, community, and social events. <clears throat> as a result, we believe our fellowship helps connect people for encouragement, accountability, and growth in the body of Christ. Well, I just want you to think about the conversations you've had this morning with others here in this body of believers. Have you talked about the weather? Have you talked about local events? Have you talked about the news? Or have you actually talked about anything that really is real in terms of your spiritual life? Some of you are going through some pretty hard things. Some of you are going through some pretty joyous things. Do we encourage each other in the joyous moments? Do we uplift each other in the hard times? Or do we really just do this as like a, hey, it is so good to see you here. I'm glad you're here with us today. I don't really care about you, but it really is good to see you. Do you understand? How do we interact with each other? It ought to be to connect us for encouragement, accountability, and growth in the body of Christ. In Hebrews chapter 10, we're reminded of these words in verse 23 through 25. Just let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Jesus Christ is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Love, whether you want to acknowledge it or not, the day is drawing near. And we are ones who are needing to continue to gather and not let the things of this world separate us from each other. The fifth value we hold to is that of tradition. We value biblical traditions which have been passed down to us through previous generations. In fact, we even have a regeneration service coming up in February. Generations. We believe when man-made traditions superimpose themselves over the glory of God, we are compelled to create new traditions based on the Word of God. In fact, that's what this past interruption in September, when I was supposed to be doing this, we were looking at killing sacred cows. And we were looking at all kinds of sacred cows. I think we looked at 15 different sacred cows that actually are a hindrance, things that we as humanity have put on the Word of God that the Word of God has nothing to say about. And we looked at how the Word of God really says these things in contradiction to those 15 man-made traditions. Because as we see, and it's even listed here, it's one of the words here, in Matthew chapter 15, we are told that a lot of times man-made traditions make the word of God have no effect or no power. Let us not fall to pray to the man-made traditions, but let us do everything we do based on the word of God and hold to those traditions that are based on the word. And as a result, we believe our traditions are to inspire us to remain faithful to the call of Christ. And I think we see a good example of this with Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, we read these words, For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am sure that is in you as well. What you see here is the passing on of traditions from grandmother to mother to son. Beloved, that is our job. We are supposed to pass on the traditions of the faith that are based on the Word of God to our kids and grandkids and our great-grandkids. Number six, world missions. We value the call of God to preach the gospel in our city, state, nation, and world. We believe God has called us to share His good news to all people and to cross racial, social, cultural barriers to fulfill the Great Commission. And as a result, we provide various means for people to share Jesus through praying for, giving to, and participating in mission opportunities. In fact, our International Missions Committee will be meeting even next week. We'll be just discussing our Ecuador missions and, and, other, and, and Haiti and, and other things that we're looking at and saying, all right, what is our rule in light of all this COVID craziness? What do we do? How do we do missions? 
internationally in this. Acts 1.8 tells us these words. Acts 1.8 says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. We are supposed to share the gospel here, there, and everywhere. As you go. Evangelism. Number seven. We value evangelism as a specific command from God to share his love with the world. We believe the body of Christ is committed to the spreading of the gospel by public preaching or personal witness. As a result, we encourage every Christ follower to always be prepared to share their faith with those around them. Whether in season or whether out of season is the way the scriptures put it. Be ready in season and out of season to give the, the hope for the reason of your call. That is what we're supposed to do. And in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 9, we read these words in verse 37 to 38. It says these words, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. Beloved, Jesus' concern was not that the lost would receive him. His concern was that the saved would not go. And so as a result, because his fear was that we would not go, he says, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out harvest workers. Beloved, you are those supposed to be those harvest workers. There are lost members of people around you. There are people in other states who are praying for their loved ones that live right here in Hardy County. And what they are praying is that you will be the answer to their prayers. Just as I am praying for my brothers in Ohio, and I am praying that somebody in Christ will speak to my brothers who will have influences on them. We are the answer to other people's prayers. And God is saying, pray to the Lord of the harvest, send harvest workers, and let us be those harvest workers. Number eight, prayer. We value prayer as the primary method to communicate with God. We believe prayer incorporates praise to our Lord for who he is, confession of our sin in order to restore a relationship with him, expressions of thanksgiving to our Lord for what he has done, and intercession for those around us as well as for our own needs. As a result, prayer helps us to seek, discern, and obey the will of God. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, we read these words, And with all prayer and petitions, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all preservation and petition for all the saints. And if you keep reading that, he's just going to keep talking about prayer some more and more and more. Now, I said I was going to pause and we were going to pray in a moment, and then we're going to pray right now because this is one of our core values. We are right now in 21 days of prayer and fasting with the Church of the Highlands. It starts today. Tomorrow through Friday at 7 a.m., we will be having the church doors open. It'll be a chance for you to come together and have us live stream the event from the Church of the Highlands. If you're not able because you're at work or something, or you're at home and there's no way you can do it because you're at home getting ready for work or something, you can actually, we'll put it on our Facebook page, but there's also a link. You can do it uh, from their, their, the Church of the Highlands website. But we'll have a link on our church's website. If you want to go to fbcbgfl.com, which, by the way, if you don't know where that is, it's in the front of your book somewhere. You can see our church's website. There's a click. There's a link to that. Then, if for some reason, because you're at work or something or you're driving and you can't be a part of the live stream live for 24 hours, the Church of the Highlands restreams it. There will be another link on our church's website to click that link to watch it, the restream. It's a different one than the live stream. The point is, it's Monday through Friday at 7 a.m. here at the church. The church is open. On Saturday at 10 a.m., the church is open. And we will be doing these live streams from now until the 29th. And on Sunday, we will have a season of prayer in here. But it's because of the fact that we believe that prayer actually does something. It is not just us talking to ourselves. We are actually praying and interceding. We are crying out to the Lord God, asking him to move in our lives and in the world's life. And he answers. He responds. Whatever we ask, he hears. If we ask it according to his will, he answers. This is the confidence that we have as his children. So we're going to just take a moment and pray. And then we'll pick up and we'll finish this stuff here in a moment. Just, by the way, is one of the areas of prayer concerns. Obviously, we do pray for people in, in health needs. Um, this morning, I got a call from uh, Roy Williamson. He was in the ER. Uh, he's, got a, he's got some kind of cold symptoms. 
He's got, they don't know if it's strep throat, they don't know if it's COVID, they don't know if it's the flu, but he was sick enough that they took him to the ER. And uh, they were running all kinds of tests on him this morning. I haven't obviously heard the results of those tests, but be in prayer for Roy. There's others. Obviously, my wife is out. She's got something going on. I ain't got a clue. But, uh, you know, let us hold fast to the scriptures. And what I mean by that, for example, in, in Psalm, Psalm chapter 91, Psalm 91 tells us in verse 9, it says, For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High your dwelling place. So where's your dwelling supposed place supposed to be? With the Lord God. That's where your dwelling place is supposed to be, the place where you abide. Now you're back to John chapter 15. I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit, but apart from me you can do nothing. Abiding, dwelling, it's the same thing. In John chapter 14, he, tells, he says to us, he says, I go and prepare a place for you, a dwelling with you. King James says a kingdom or a mansion. Wrong translation. It's actually dwelling. God is sitting there saying, you know what your dwelling place is? It's me in you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. God lives in you, and he's preparing a place for you to dwell with him in eternity. But right now, you are that dwelling place. And so he says here, he says, for, for you have made the Lord my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any place come near your dwelling place. Love, we need to hold truth to the scriptures. Let the scriptures be the thing that we hold on to in our times of sickness. Let's go to the Father just for a moment in prayer. Lord, I do, I praise you that you do hear us. I thank you that you answer our prayers. I thank you that it is your heart's intentions in terms of sickness and disease, that it is your heartbeat, that, that the perfect theology is found in Jesus, and that everywhere we see Jesus move, was, there was never a funeral. He didn't raise the dead. There was never a sick that asked that he did not heal. So, Father, we pray for Roy right now. We pray for Christy right now. We pray for others in this place that, that have also got sickness or disease of some sort or infirmities. And we say, Lord, move in the midst of them all. Heal them indeed. Let them find their true dwelling place within you. And there, no sickness can dwell. For you are perfection in every aspect of our life. But, Father, there's other areas in which we come before, and we've been mentioning these different core values that we have. And so, Father, we do pray for our families and for generations. And we pray, as a result, we pray for our associate pastor that, that we've been praying for and saying, Lord God, send the appropriate person to minister to our students. Yes, Father, it comes down to the family, but let this individual be a right ministry match for us. And let the search committee not grow weary in doing good because they will reap a harvest in due time if they will remain faithful to their course. And so, Father, we keep searching, we keep seeking, we keep knocking and asking and asking you to bring the right associate pastor to this church. Father, we, every week we see these capital campaign banners on our sides. Father, we may be small in number and we may have a large budget in front of us that is needing to be fulfilled, that we're going to be doing this at the speed of faith. But Father, the beauty is, is that you are the one that can do all things and that you, you can do abundantly more than we could ever think or imagine. And you know already who and where the resources are going to come to fulfill this goal. So we are asking you, open up our hearts and open up our minds and give us the wisdom to know and trust you, believing that you as the one who has a cattle on a thousand hills that you will provide for every ministry endeavor that you place in front of us, knowing that you are faithful and you are good. But I, I pray even for, for revival, even during this 21 days of prayer and fasting, I pray revival falls upon First Baptist Church of Bowling Green, that your children will become more renewed and more passionate and more desirous to seek you and to know you and to spend time with you and to grow in their walk with you. And then as a result, because of that, to be a, a contagious example of a light on a hill shining brightly in the midst of the darkness so that lost individuals will come to know Christ Jesus as we are bold watchmen on the wall saying, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Let us be audaciously obedient to you. Help us to have a burden towards the lostness of a world and not that of condemnation. Let us not bemoan the challenges and the struggles that we face, but let us see our purpose as ambassadors of the gospel of reconciliation. Father, we do pray that you would continue to work within us in terms of our ministries and our missions. We do pray for, 
for um, the ministry that's going down on in Ecuador. And Father, even in regards to that, with Pato's wife having had COVID, and Father, I just pray for her continual recovery and that it doesn't hinder them from the work that they're doing there in Tabacundo and La Esperanza and San Jose Chico and Cayambi and so forth. Father, let your ministry continue to grow and expand and may disciples truly be born and grow and that these disciples then carry on the ministry even when people are absent. Father, we pray for Pastor Adams there in Haiti. We pray for Mike Williams' ministry there in the Dominican Republic with the cups of cold water. Father, we just ask, we pray for, for Kenya and for the Rivers family that are there. Father, we pray even for the, for, for the ministry that's going on in the Himalayas that we learned about even at Christmas. Father, there are lost people throughout this world, and there's only one that is worthy of their worship, and we pray that your gospel would be proclaimed across this world, even into the hard places. And may First Baptist Church of Bowling Green play a part in the expansion of the gospel. Father, I also pray that you would give us an intense hatred towards sin. Help us to hate sin. Oh, Lord God. Help us desire righteousness. Help us to desire holiness. Help us to desire purity. Help us to desire faith. Help us to desire love. Help us to desire you. For you to be our satisfaction, for you to be our all in all, for you to be our sufficiency. Oh, Lord God, do a work within us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The last core value that we hold to is that of obedience. We value obedience as an outward expression, an outward expression, an outward expression. You all say it with me as an outward expression of our true relationship with God. It is not a light to be hid under a bushel. No. We let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Do not be cowardice in this world. We believe immediate obedience proves His will is above all and prevents roadblocks in our relationship with the Lord. And as a result, God is brought glory. And we see in 1 John 5, 3, we see these words. It says, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. To follow the Lord God is not hard. It is actually quite easy. Now, these are the core values. Now, if we follow these core values, it actually leads and tells us to see the type of church we want to be. And that's actually where the vision for First Baptist Church of Bowling Green comes from. We see a church who is Christ-centered as it teaches traditional biblical values to its families through the preaching of the world. And what that actually means for us, when we say that this is what we see, this it means that this is in what we believe regarding that. We see the church as, as uh, we, we, the church we see believes in marriage between a man and a woman built through Christ-centered love, accountability, and growth from the Bible. The church we, we see believes in creating and sustaining traditions that bring glory to God. The church we see believes in encouraging all believers to grow in their relationship with the Lord through the Holy Spirit. The next thing that we see in terms of the vision of our church is we see a church who shares the gospel with its city, state, nation, and world. In other words, the church we see believes in the Great Commission, which tells us to go and make disciples of all nations. The church we see believes in using evangelism as a tool to share the love of Jesus. And the church we see believes in equipping every member to be prepared to share their faith through testimony. This is what we see. We may not be doing it perfectly yet, but this is where we are striving to become. The third thing that we see then in terms of our vision is we see a church who is heavily encouraged through worship and fellowship of the body of Christ. In other words, the church we see believes a personal relationship with Jesus is necessary for authentic worship. The church we see believes corporate worship is an extension of personal daily worship with the Lord. And the church we see believes fellowship unites the body of Christ through encouragement, accountability, and growth. Are any of these words sounding familiar to what we saw in the core values? All of them are. Because every one of these vision statements comes from the core values. And this leads to the final area of our vision, and that is that we see a church who communicates with God through prayer as it seeks to discern and obey the will of God. In other words, the church we see believes prayer should be used to praise God, confess sin, express thanksgiving, and intercede for others. The church we see believes immediate obedience is the proper faithful response to God's will. And the church we see believes prayer and obedience are imperative for the revitalization of the body of Christ. 
And when you take that vision, you can then break that vision down into one simple sentence. And we have said this sentence so many times that every one of you in this place ought to be able to say it. First Baptist Church is Christ-centered, gospel-driven, joyfully united, and prayerfully obedient. Every one of those statements comes straight from this vision statement, which comes straight from the core values. We didn't just sit as a strategic planning team and say, oh, let's just get together and talk. We were going somewhere. We were seeing a church that is doing all of these things. And as we become Christ-centered, then it makes us gospel-driven. As we are gospel-driven, it makes us joyfully united because we get our eyes off of ourselves and we get our eyes onto the commissions of God. And then when we get our eyes onto the commissions of God, we then become prayerfully obedient people. It is with intentionality. And then that leads us to your logo. First Baptist Church of Bowling Green didn't also just choose a logo just for the sake of saying, hey, we got to have a cool logo. But we do. But we do. We chose the church logo as a tree that has been shaped in the form of a globe. It bears in its imagery all the components of our vision and mission. The Bible uses the imagery of grapes and vines. And in the same way, Jesus would be the roots of the tree. If there are no roots, then the tree will die. Beloved, if Jesus Christ is not the root of our church, we will die. So as we are driven to share the gospel, we prayerfully hope these prospects will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. If they have indeed received Jesus as Lord and Savior, then we joyfully disciple them to be united to the body of Christ. This new believer then begins to grow, and as they continue to obey the Lord, the more their, uh, the more their passions will match his passions because Christ is the center of their life. As this growing believer grows, they will then obey and start being gospel-driven in order to bring more and more people to Jesus. The more the gospel is proclaimed, the more excited the total body of Christ becomes and the more joyfully united we become because our eyes get off of ourselves and get on him and his work. The more united we are, the more we understand God did not call us to keep the gospel to ourselves and our community only, but rather to take the gospel to the world. So because Christ is the center of our being and we are gospel driven by his passions, we joyfully become united to share this hope with the world and we prayerfully seek his guidance and join him where he is already at work. We call this joining him in this work obedience, and the longer we do this, the bigger and healthier our global tree becomes. And that is the reason why we chose the globe as a tree as our logo. It wasn't an accident. Well, this is who we are. This is who we are as First Baptist Church of Bowling Green. And it is now our job to take this and share it with the world. Now, over the next five weeks, we're going to go into a lot more stuff. So bring your books back every single week. Maybe, you, maybe you're here for the first time. You're sitting there going, Scott, I have no idea what you're talking about. But you certainly keep talking about Jesus. But you know why I keep talking about Jesus? Because he's the most important thing. We're going to have this time of invitation. And the reason we are as weird as we are about Jesus is because Jesus saved us. He died on a cross to pay for our sins, for our wrongs. We, each one of us have done wrong. And we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And Jesus Christ says, yeah, you may have fallen short of the glory, but I have a gift that I want to give to you, and that gift is me. And if you want to receive Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's that simple. During this time of invitation, all we ask you to do is come down and talk with me. I'd love to share with you how you can actually enter into a relationship with the Lord Jesus. But I'll just tell you, for those that are watching online, for those that are here, it's simple. It's just crying out, saying, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I know I've done wrong. I know I've disappointed you. I know I've missed the mark. Forgive me. Let your Holy Spirit enter into my life. Forgive me of my sins, and let me have a relationship with you. Key imperative phrase there, relationship with you. If you'll cry that out, he promises, says, I'll, I will. I will. I'll come in, and I'll save you. I'll have a relationship with you. And we have this time of invitation where you can come and make that decision publicly because that's also one of the things, because Jesus says, he says, become saved and then follow in obedience. And the first obedience is that of baptism. It's our public declaration. And this is the way you start that process here at First Baptist Church of Bowling Green.
So during this time of invitation, if you've never cried out to see Jesus, come down the aisle. Maybe you need to be praying for somebody. You can come to these steps that we call altars. Maybe the Holy Spirit's telling you to do something else. You just be obedient to the Holy Spirit during this time of invitation. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for your glory. I thank you for your love. I thank you that this is indeed who we are at First Baptist Church of Bowling Green. I thank you for these, these core values that drive everything that we do, every ministry that we're a part of, whether internationally or here locally as we do C3 events, Carrying Christ to our community events, as we do ministries even here at the church. Father, I thank you for your faithfulness in the midst of it all. And I pray that even right now, that our hearts would grow stronger and stronger in our faith with you, and that our expression of that faith would be evident to all who are watching, and that you would be glorified. Father, minister to us. Minister to us even right now as we walk in obedience to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.